The point of this slide is I'm going to make I'm going to give you some uh, examples, and I want to have you think from the alien's perspective. So imagine you look like that. Anybody recognize that alien? Okay. All right. So you're all plant people. I don't want you to say it out loud. I want you to raise hands. Does anybody know what this plant is? One, two, that's it? Okay, good, this is a good thing. Now let me show you what it looks like when it's older. I mean, well, actually, around the time that these are showing up. Anybody recognize those? All right, and then this is what you eat. So the first principle that I want to get across to you, because we're going to talk about wild foods, and people have weird conceptions about wild foods, okay? But wild, all wild foods are traditional foods we've lost touch with. They're not crazy, they're not about survival, they're normal foods that we don't eat anymore because now we're eating out of the supermarket and they've narrowed it down to very few foods. Rather than all this great diversity we used to eat, now we eat very little diversity. So that's the first concept. All wild foods are traditional, okay? And the point of this was that if you're gonna learn about wild foods, because I'm, I'm teaching you, because I'm assuming you're interested in learning this topic, or even teaching this topic at some point, because you're you know, master gardeners, or some of you are, most of you are. Um, so if you go off wildflower guides, you know, that's how we initially learned about plants years and years ago, wildflower guys. So they just show you a picture of the plant in flower, like the very first picture. So how are you going to know in the description, if they give you one picture of the flower, what the young shoots look like if you didn't know, if you're an alien and you didn't know what asparagus looked like? It's not helping you at all. Right? So you need to know the natural history of a plant. It's not like going to the supermarket where you could go in blindfolded and grab vegetables and then eat them and you're not going to die. In nature, you're making the decisions that the people who do the farming and the food processing and all that kind of stuff, you're making those decisions for you. They're not making those decisions for you anymore. So you got to know more. This is not a lazy person's occupation. Okay. Now, in history, our parents used to teach us all these things. So by the age of five, you knew everything that was edible and how and why and how to avoid the poisonous parts and stuff like that, right? So we don't have that anymore. So now it's all on you, okay? So let's look at another principle. What wild food is this? Uh, wrong answer. It's not a wild food. It was a trick question. So um, if, uh, if, if an alien came down and you said, you know, whatever you can see on this thing is edible, and they ate it, they would be fine, assuming they have the same digestive tract that we have, right? No problem, just like in the supermarket, right? So what if I told an alien that this is edible, but gave them no more information. <laughs> so this is a thing about wild foods. Lettuce is what I call a fast food, because you can just eat it the way it is. But the artichoke is not a fast food. That is a food you need to know the technical details about or you're going to have a miserable, ex if you tried to eat it like an apple, you'd be in pain, <laughs> right? So some, you know, so wild foods run the gamut of that. They, you've got the wild fast foods, and then you've got the, f the wild foods that have technical information that you have to work out in order to make it edible. 
Okay, so let's review the three concepts that I've talked about so far. So you need to know the natural history of the plant. You need to know what it looks like at all stages of growth. You need to know what the edible parts look like at their prime. How many here tried dandelions and hate them? Come on, be brave. Yeah, right? Well, that's because you don't know what you're doing. Right? I didn't, when I first tried it, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the natural history. I didn't know how to choose, how to judge whether those leaves were in prime shape. I knew what season to get them in, or at least what conditions that create seasonal-like leaves. Okay? And we'll talk about dandelion in detail. Uh, food technology matters. It matters how you process that food, <laughs> what you do with it. I mean, some plants are actually poisonous. How many here know what pokeweed is? Anybody? Yeah, that's raw, poisonous in the raw form, but you get the young, tender parts, and you boil it for five minutes, and it's perfectly edible and delicious, and they have pokeweed festivals out east where they eat this stuff like crazy. Of course, more people are poisoned by pokeweed than any other plant <laughs> because people don't know you're supposed to cook it first. That's the technology part. Perfectly edible five minutes of boiling. Okay? Um, and that all wild foods are traditional foods we've lost touch with. So that's why I want to get rid of this idea of survival. You know, these are normal foods. Just get re-in touch with them. All right, so let me give you the definition of edible wild plants. Uh, of course, I made this up. And the reason I made it up was because there was no definition before, but you need this. Okay? So... Edible wild plants are wild plants endowed with one or more parts, you know, I'm highlighting parts of this, right, that can be used for food if gathered at the appropriate stage of growth and properly prepared. Again, the supermarket makes these decisions for you, but on your own, you have to figure this stuff out. If you don't know parts, stage of growth, and proper preparation, you don't know enough about that plant to be eating it. Okay? So these are the reasons why I'm not just coming here and showing you 50 wild foods. We're going to look at like six. Because if I showed you 50 wild foods, you're not going to get it. You're not going to understand it at all. Okay? So <laughs> let's see what's out there. All right, so I'm showing you universal plants. And I think every single one of these is I'm selling my book out there. So on the break or whatever, you can come buy one. But um, uh, all the pictures that are in here are in my book, except for the alien thing. <laughs> All right, so um, I wish it was a little darker in here, but this is farmland where the farmer tilled the soil, went over it with a seed disperser, whatever those things are called, watered it, but the seed disperser didn't work. So he abandoned the field. But guess what? For about three football fields length, that's filled with two of the most nutritious leafy greens ever analyzed. Wild spinach, which is also known as lamb's quarters, and green amaranth. Okay? Wild spinach is the second most nutritious leafy green ever analyzed, and amaranth is like the fifth. But guess what happens to that? They till it over, right? That's all good for you. could fill up two semi-trucks with that. But it all goes to waste because we don't know what to do with it, OK? So here's wild spinach, again, also known as lamb's quarters. Here's a close-up. Notice no flower, right? Because that's the prime. This is when you pick this. When it's in leaf, not when it's in flower. You can pick it in flower and you can eat it in flower. It's just not choice anymore. Some plants, when it's in flower, it's not only not choice, but you're spitting the whole thing out, right? It's not worth it. So look at the detail on here. You can see the sort of white powdery substance on there. That actually makes this plant waterproof, which is part of identifying it if you want. If you're like little you know, queasy about, well, did I get that right? You can dip it in water, pull it out, it'll be totally dry. Okay, so that little white waxy powder on there 
is making it waterproof. But it's one of the identifying characteristics. And this is what it looks like magnified about a thousand times. So um, that repels water. And then this is what the plant looks like when it gets a little bit older. How many of you recognize this plant? <laughs> yes, it's everywhere. <laughs> All you have to do is turn over the soil and it grows. It's easy. Wild, fast food. You don't have to do anything to this. You just pluck off the leaves and eat it. And in fact, the rapidly growing upper stems, you know, the, the upper stem up here, like maybe uh, upper five inches when it's rapidly growing, you can eat that like asparagus. It's delicious. It's not called wild spinach for nothing. And this is about mm, maybe 30 seconds of gathering when it's, you know, growing well. Boy, that's cheaper than buying organic vegetables at the supermarket. And that this, was, this is what it looks like on normal food. Because you don't have to do some wild, elaborate, wild food dinner. You just make a sandwich, and you put it on like you would be eating lettuce. Perfectly good for that. It's a normal food, right? And, and over here, this is the cooked greens. Now, this particular green is super heavy when you cook it. You know, it doesn't like melt away to nothing. It actually gets concentrated. So that's actually about three servings of cooked greens right there. And then this is the upper stems, cooked and served like asparagus. And you can put on hollandaise sauce if you want, right? You can do it, you can treat it any way you treat normal food. It's normal food. Or you can put it on a pizza, right? Uh, that, I think the, the wild spinach is the only wild thing on there, which is fine because when I eat wild foods, I'm not trying to be some austere monk who's only eating wild foods. I would be spending all my time doing that. You know, it's a lot of work if you're just going to be doing nothing but that, you know, particularly with the harder wild foods. But this is wild fast food. It's just easy. You grab it, you throw it on whatever you're cooking, right? Anyone recognize this plant? This is chickweed. Okay, a lot of things got named after animals, you know, like chickens, chickweed. They love it. I love it. Right? Um, this is just after it's peaking, meaning as soon as it starts flowering, it's still at its choice stage, but then it starts going downhill. And to pick this, if you go to your normal wild food book, not mine, but if you go to your normal wild food book, uh, they don't distinguish where the real choice stuff is, and it's only the upper inch and a half. If you go below that, it's like eating straw. So a lot of people take a big, long, you know, stems of this, chop it up, throw it in a salad, and then they're like pulling strands out of their teeth. <laughs> and they're going, why does anybody eat this wild food? but it's because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know the technology necessary to get the choice stuff out of here. And what you do is you find it like this, and you just take your hand, and you grab the upper part, and you take a scissors, and you got a salad in your hand. Right? Now, if this is growing spread out, I don't even pick this, because then I have to like grab you know, every little end I got to sit there and cut. Now I use the scissors. That's my primary tool. Uh, but here, I just grab the tops, do this, and I've got it. Because I'm a busy guy and I don't have time to waste. You're all busy people, right? Let's not waste time. Um, and then here, you can see this is what you, you know, if you have a good book, mine's a good book, <laughs> you compare lookalikes side by side. Not even separate photographs, but side by side, because you want to see, because the, the one on the left here, this is called mouse-eared chickweed. That um, particular plant is edible, but not choice. You know, you throw it in a salad, and if it's mixed in enough with other things, it's just another addition to your salad. And why would you want to do that with a non-choice food? Why would you add that? Desperate? No, no, no. <laughs> Diversity in the diet, the, tr the real, the true Mediterranean diet, 
should be called the Mediterranean wild food diet. Because the Greeks on the island of Crete that, that originated that diet, I mean, they didn't make up a diet, that's how they ate. They ate, on average, about 110 different species of plants. That's where a lot of their health came from, the diversity. So even if something isn't choice, you add it because of all the, you know, salad dressing you put on, <laughs> right? So, you know, um, you put on a lot of stuff you like, and you put on some stuff that's sort of neutral, and you learn to enjoy the flavors. But again, that's not choice. Here is the actual chickweed, and that's choice. That is delicious. It, it, it sort of tastes like corn silk. It's amazing, the flavor. Tender, as you can imagine. You can make a whole salad out of that. And then over here is scarlet pimpernel, which some people consider it poisonous. And, uh, I, you know, in fact, in my first volume one of my book series, I'm working on volume two and three now, um, I actually call that poisonous because the first references I came to said it was a poisonous plant. But I've done more research since then and found out that in Europe, they eat this. So it's not poisonous. So the question is, why do some people think it's poisonous and some not? So that's my job to figure out the nuances of that so I can pass that on to you in my books. So, and here's chickweed in some pocket bread with some other food. Normal food, right? Anybody know this plan? <laughs> really? Okay, so dandelions were the most misunderstood plants there is. You know, I remember the first time I tried this, I gagged on it because I was like eating dried up old dandelion that was growing in my yard because that's where I saw it and I heard it was edible. So I put it in my mouth and spit it out because it was so bitter and harsh and tough, right? That's because I didn't know what I was doing. But here, this is at its prime. How many of you heard that uh, you eat dandelion leaves uh, before the flower stalks appear? Anybody hear that? Yeah, that's an old folk tale. That's wrong. When the flower stalks appear is when this guy wakes up and starts growing like crazy. Okay? And rapid growth is the key to tenderness. Not size of leaf. You can have a tiny leaf that's tough and bitter, and you can have a large leaf I mean, you can get a dandelion leaf that big, but because it's rapidly growing, it hasn't reached its end size yet because it's got all this water and nutrients and everything else, that's still choice. Okay? So it's rapid growth that defines tenderness, and that's all the plants you get in the store, all the lettuces and the broccolis and everything else. Rapid growth. I mean, you know this from growing plants yourself. Okay? So what's edible on this? Those leaves are edible, the flowers are edible, the buds are edible, and even the stalk leading to the flower. Is this working? Yeah. Even the stalk here, so the very upper stalk is still rapidly growing. The lower part of the stalk becomes uh, uh, fibrous pretty quickly, but you could actually cut this here, and from there up, you can eat all of that, okay? Because it's rapidly growing, that's why. Um, so, what, yeah, yeah, flowers, a waste of flowers if you ask me, and I'll show you why. Okay, are these all dandelion leaves? Which are, which are and which are not? Oh, you people are mumblers. Okay, these two are dandelion leaves. These two, these center ones here. This is cat's ear, which we have way more of in Oregon. And most people, they think they're, they got dandelions, but it's cat's ear. And then on this side, this is wild chicory. Now, th these leaves can vary just as much as these two dandelion leaves vary. So there's, a lot, there's different ways to tell them you, you know, uh, a part, and I s explain some of that in my book, and I, I show it on workshops all the time. Uh, but yeah, so these kinds of leaves, very common. 
So if you want to reduce bitterness, now some people love bitterness. Some people can't even taste bitterness, right? Um, but for those, you know, where, where instead of bitterness going to the pleasure centers of the brain, they go to the torture centers of the brain. That's me. Um, what you do is the, the sap is where all the bitterness concentrates. So if you just cut off the lower fourth or the lower third of those leaves where it's all, you know, nothing but stem, then you've reduced the bitterness substantially just by doing that. And then you chop it finely. So if you're going to put it in a salad, you sprinkle it on just to taste. And then it adds a nice sharpness to the salad without overpowering you. If you throw whole leaves in there, you're going to be miserable unless you love bitter. Uh, and then this is the core of, this is the, you know, dandelion actually has a little miniature stem, but you don't realize that all the leaves are coming off of a stem. So th this is considered the uh, crown right here, the root crown. Um, and so that's edible too, as are all the young flower buds that are just emerging. This is a tiny thing that I'm showing you right here. So that's all edible too. You can eat them raw, but um, uh, particularly the crown has lots and lots of the sap in there. So it's actually sticky mouthfeel, and so most people enjoy it better if you cook it. And this is what the root crowns look like on the outside. So what we were just looking at was the leaves taken off of here and this part right here. Now this particular root went down about three feet. So if you just chop off the top of a dandelion, it's coming back. And then... Wild fast food. Wild fast food. What did I do here? I plucked a few flowers. And kids love this kind of a thing. Adults love this kind of a thing. People go, what is that on my you know, sandwich? So here we've got uh, dandelion flowers on a regular tuna fish open face sandwich. And it's open face because I don't want to hide the flowers. I could close it. Right? And then over here is wild carrot leaf. There's some borage leaves, that's also edible. There's some wild mustard, field mustard leaves. And then here's a pickle from the supermarket. <laughs> and this is called pond lily soup. <laughs> so this is, and way better than dandelion wine, this is dandelion flower petal soup. Just the petals. You know, use five or ten petals per cup of water. Bring it to a boil. Add some salt. It's delicious. Wild, fast food. Right? And then this is, anybody recognize these leaves here? That's miner's list. How about these guys? Those are English daisies. You find them in the parks and stuff. Okay? And then this is uh, pencil asparagus from the supermarket. Just to simulate a pond. But you can see... You can see, like right here, is a petal. So once you cook, the, pe the petals are sweet. But once you cook them, they taste like the leaves with zero bitterness. Zero bitterness. And of course, you make straws out of the flower, right? <laughs> this is non-plastic straws. <laughs> So, you know, you've got some kids, bring out a whole, whole bouquet of uh, dandelion flowers, clip one, say, drink. There you go. You've got juice in it. Now, this is cat's ear. This is not dandelion. This is that miserable plant that when you go over it with a lawnmower, it laughs in your face. <laughs> right? You're not cutting me. There's no, even the stems that come up, they just bend over and they come back up. So... This is what I call lawn-adapted cat's ear. So when you mow the area on a regular basis, there are genes in these plants that are protective and will stop growing up, and they'll grow out, and they flatten, and they'll kill all the grass around the plant. So when you pull up cat's ear from your yard, it leaves a bald spot. If you pull up dandelions, it doesn't, because dandelions grow up. Okay. And this is what it looks like when you're not mowing it. And these leaves are edible too, just not dandelion. They're about 75% as bitter as dandelion leaves. 
And then the flowers look different. So that's day one, day two, and day three of what the flowers look like. So, you know, if you have a wildflower guide and they're just showing you one picture, sometimes it can fool you. Anyone recognize this plant? Do you know all these plants? <laughs> yes, you do, most of you. Uh, yeah, this is common mallow. It's one of my favorite plants. Not a nasturtium. How does this look different than nasturtium? It's a different leaf. Yeah, well, that's a good description. OK, in any event, um, so common mallow, it's everywhere. Just like dandelions are everywhere, because these are universal plants. They're found everywhere, making them wild fast food if they're edible raw. And these are edible raw and delicious, no bitterness, a little bit hairy. But most of the traditional <coughs> vegetables, or most of the traditional greens, were hairy. It's just they've been all selected out, so we don't get them in the stores anymore. So if you don't want to sense the hairs, then don't make a whole salad out of this. You know, make a third of the salad out of this, and then you don't sense the hairs at all. Okay, a little bit of technology helps solve the problem. Okay, and this is what it looks like floating through space. So it can grow along the ground, or it can grow upright. And here you can see the flowers, the leaves, and then here are the little, what I call, mallow peas. Some, some people call this cheese weed, you know, because they think that looks like a cheese round. But if you look close, it looks more like a tractor tire. So <laughs> it's a miserable name for a plant. And here's a close-up of the flower. It looks sort of like hibiscus, because it's closely related to hibiscus. It's also related to the marshmallow. You know, there really is a marshmallow plant. Yeah. Because it, it's a mallow that grew in the marshes. And here are, this is what the mallow piece looked like. So here's the bracts that it was in, like that. So that's what it looks like extracted. And those things are like okra. In the raw... They sort of just taste like a regular vegetable, but as soon as you cook them, they get mucilaginous. Okay, which means sort of thick and gooey and, and just like okra. So you can use them to make gumbo. So this is what I call mallow mumbo gumbo soup. <laughs> right? So, and you can see them floating around in there. That's these guys right there. Okay? And I also use the mallow piece here. We actually, these were ones where I extracted the mucilage out, and then I just you know, had a cornbread recipe and just threw them in with that, and they were delicious. Normal food. Not wacky wild foods, normal food. Of course, what do you do with the mallow juice? You whip it. So you can't, if you just do regular mallow juice without any additives, it won't do this. It'll sort of foam up, but then it'll lose the foam. So the key is you start with one egg white, and then you keep adding mallow, and mallow, mallow, and just grows and grows and grows and grows. So this is a wild huckleberry mallow meringue pie. So the only thing that's not wild on there is this crust. That took some work. Well, so did picking the berries. You know, this is that that took work. But I'm demonstrating something. You know, because you make a pie, that's work. It doesn't just, you know, throw all the ingredients in a tub and it makes a pie. No, you gotta construct it, right? So same thing with this. Now this takes a little bit more work because you've got to extract the mallow and then you've got to whip it up and then, you know. Um, but that's a little bit faster, actually faster, than doing that. Remember, this is related to the marshmallow. So if you take those mallow peas and you take that mallow juice, you can actually make mallow mallows. <laughs> and they taste just like regular marshmallows. And, and here's the store-bought marshmallows right there. They're delicious. They're a little softer because, you know, you don't have the technical extrusion process that they do, you know, for the, the ones you buy in the store. 
Now, you're not doing this to save money. <laughs> you can get a whole bag of marshmallows for 99 cents. It takes four hours to do this. <laughs> you know, and you need a food dryer. You know, to make it from goopy stuff to actually mallow mallows. But the real genius of that is that if you've got 12 crazy kids driving you nuts <laughs> and you tell them there's s'mores at the end of this, they'll just get in line and process and do all the stuff that's not, they'll take up all the work <laughs> while you're just watching and smiling. Okay, so um, remember what I said about knowing plants throughout their natural history. That's their whole, all their life stages and stuff. Well, so does anyone recognize these seedlings? That's purslane, yeah. So if, you're, if you've got a, a garden plot or something and you know what all the seedlings look like, what you could do is, and I, I, I do this now, is all my raised beds, except for the ones I'm doing experimental work in, I just turn over the soil and water, and then when the seedlings come in, I just pluck out all the non-edibles. And the rest of it comes in like an orchestra of edibles. Right? So if you know what to pluck out, and it's easy doing the early weeding. Very easy. Okay? So know your plants. So here's the common mallow. That's what common mallow looks like as a seedling right there. And then you've got the uh, purslane right there. And then there's this finger growing out of the ground. <laughs> now, the time to eat the purslane? When does that peak? Well, so purslane, the, the question is when does the purslane peak? And it's like, Purslane loves heat and sunlight. So unless you've got an unshaded area, it's not going to grow. And it's, it starts growing in the summer. And, and then it just goes like gangbusters to, the, to now. You can eat it the whole summer. You can eat it the whole summer, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's delicious, more omega-3s than any other plant ever analyzed. Yeah. You eat it. You eat it. You just eat it. Tell your friends to come over. You're going to have a feast. They're excited because you're showing them wild foods. They pick it for you. There's a lot of solutions to that problem. Okay, so here's, this is years ago, but, you know, I just, I, this is when I still grew domesticated plants in the beds, right? I stopped now. But uh, I had tomato plants growing. And so what, you know, you turn over the soil, you plant the tomato plants, and then what you do is you harvest Outward from the plant, as this plant gets taller, I harvest further and further out. This is all wild food right here. That's all wild food. You know, baby greens, you could call it at this stage. So as the tomato plant's growing, I just harvest further and further out to the point where here's the other tomato plant that then they're all gone by the time I'm doing it. So you're not weeding, you're harvesting. Right? How do I prepare what? Purslane. Well, you just eat it raw. Just eat it in the salad. You can pickle it. You can cook it. It's a normal food. Do whatever you want to it. Beat it. There's a wicked cousin, though, right? There's a what? A wicked cousin. Well, the, the, uh, that, I'm glad you brought that up. She said there's a wicked cousin. So there's a few plants that sort of look like it, but if you've... If, you're learning from a good source, you'll know it so well that the other ones won't even look like lookalikes. That's the key. Poor wild food books don't give you the details about one particular plant enough so that you go with confidence out and gather that plant. That's the problem. It's the, it's the resources. It's not your fault. A lot of us think, I just can't learn this stuff. No, the resources are crappy. Right? So get some good resources. And, and um, if, you, if you take my workshops eventually and stuff like that, then you know, I point all that stuff out. I have an intro class, and I lay out a whole bunch of books, and I talk about the good and the bad and the ugly. You know? So um, yeah, so there's ways to learn this stuff. Now, this is an organic farm, 
filled with wild spinach and green amaranth, which they are weeding out and using as mulch. Fine use, better as a food. If the society knew how good these plants were and weren't afraid to experiment, you know, like when you go in the store, you just buy things you're always buying. You know, how many times do you just go in there and go, I'm going to do nothing but buy foods I've never eaten? When do you do that? You don't, right? So, but if people knew and were willing to experiment, the farmers could put these in the supermarket and if people would buy them and then there'd be a commercial source. So farmers could actually make more money because all these workers would be harvesting food which would earn the farmer money so he could pay more laborers. So with that, I'm going to, uh, we've got uh, just enough time. I'm going to show you this is, uh, uh, just some examples out of my book because I want you to understand the difference between you know, a poorly written book and a book that really gives you the detail that you need. So here, uh, I do a chapter per plant. It's not, you know, if you buy a wild food book that's like a catalog, so it's got one picture, and then it's got a description and habitat and range and you know, edibility and nuances about the history all on one page, that's not enough. A couple of sentences on edibility, not enough. I mean, you already know more about the dandelion than 99% of the wild food books tell you about. They just go, leaves are edible. Not enough, right? So, um, so here, on this, I'm talking about sheep sorrel here. How many know what sheep sorrel is? Yeah, right? So um, uh, I, got, I give you the range. I, ta I, I have all of the Latin names that have been used throughout history right there. All the common names, or, you know, the most common, common names. Um, what the plant looks like, how you will typically see it. You know, a lot of things are called sour grass, you know, because they're sour. No, this is sour grass because it looks like grass. That's where it got the name. So, you know, when you see the clover kind of sorrels, that's not sour grass. This is sour grass. Uh, young, this is what the young plant looks like. I'm even showing you where the little arrowhead lobes, the earlobes start coming out there. So that's, you know, just the first couple of pages of this plant, which, you know, I've got like 12 pages on this plant alone. And then here's uh, wild spinach, also known as lamb's quarters. So this is what the seedling looks like. I'm showing you a close look alike because this is what amaranth seedling looks like, side by side. Just with these two, you know, you got it. Uh, I, you know, here's the little crystals on there. And then here are the two most, I wish it was darker in here, but here are the two most common forms of it because not all leaves look alike, right? So there's a sharper leaved up here and a more rounded leaf right here, but they're both wild spinach. And then this is, you know, common mallow. So again, here's this, what the seedling looks like, what the larger leaves look like, showing you the prostate prostate, prostrate um, <laughs> version of it. And then, uh, you know, here's the flower down here. And again, this is only two pages of 22 pages on this plant alone because there's so much you can do with it. And I invented the recipes for the meringue and the marshmallow and, or mallow mallow. So that, this is a longer chapter because it's nowhere else. Can't get it anywhere else. Okay. And then, you know, recipes, you know, normal standard recipes with some pictures in there uh, of processing where it's uh, uh, necessary. Uh, here's the, the mallow mumbo gumbo soup, and then here's the, the mallow uh, mumbo gumbo sauce. Does the mallow grow tall? It can grow tall or it can grow along the ground, yeah. Two different ways, two different uh, Same plant, just, you know, some have different preferences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, if you had this whole chapter, you'd know it. There's no problem with that. Uh, and then uh, whenever there's a look-alike, I'll put it on different paper. So you know you're looking at a look-alike, yeah. Does it have a name, do you know? Is it a farm, farm, farm name or something? Oh, there's a million, you know, uh, it's, it, as well as a million other plants, it's also called pigweed. Yeah. And why pigweed? And why is that? 
Pigs eat it. Everything's called pigweed. You know, it's like, forget that name. It's a terrible name. All right, so, uh, and I also have uh, authoritative nutrient data on this stuff because, uh, you know, my PhD is in nutrition. So I actually go back in the literature and got this. This is nowhere else. 